All right, here we go, Steve. Clear back, please. Thank you, everyone. My line's clear. Thank you. Ten on the top light. Forty. Forty. Okay, and put on the uh, front, the Hudson, please. Examine the scrapes in the different light and all the wear and tear. It's really good. Let's go to start two, please. Yeah, that's why I'm wondering if literally we consider, I mean, I think that having the space around the pads is great. Let's eliminate the place. Okay, so fall back to behind the camera, please. I'm not saying, like, necessarily here. Yeah. 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 Look at you guys. We're really doing this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Ridiculous. Let's roll camera, please. Oh, my God, that is cool. This was when we were first starting to see what Batman would look like on film. You know, Rob just being able to, to stand there and figure out how it would feel to be Batman, and you could watch him transform. And we did the same thing to see Zoe in her suit. And so she came out, and then we had to see the two of them together. It was like this kind of like in-between world. Like we were almost there, but not quite. But it's cool because you kind of get a taste of what it will really be like on set. For the first time, you were really seeing what this version of these characters would look like, and you were seeing it being born right there in front of you. I find that really fun to try and find just a new way of doing something when you know a lot of your heroes have played it before. Yeah, and then the terror, the terror kicks in. <laughs> the beginning of the terror. I think that the Batman, it's one of those rare places where culture, popular culture and art meets at its, at its, you know, fullest. And it's almost like the more people reinterpret it, the space to reinvent it gets smaller, but I think it actually just gets more specific. The first conversation I had with Matt about it, I just knew there was something radically different from anything we'd seen in Batman movies before. Ready, and... Three, two, one, action! From the beginning, I didn't want to do an origin tale. I didn't feel that I had some new way of doing that story. I wanted to do an imperfect Batman, really rock him to his core. I don't care what happens to me. That is what I'm afraid about. To not be in total control, who was being challenged by these crimes and who didn't know how to do all of these things yet. So you were seeing a Batman who was still becoming. Renewal is about growth now. Matt just had an angle on something. I mean, there's definitely made some bold stylistic choices, but also story choices as well. Even some of the major plot points are even in the comics. They're just wholly original. Nolan did an incredible job with Batman. Zack Snyder did an incredible job. Schumacher, Burton, when you take this on, it's significant. You're terrified, and then you get over your terror and your fear, and you go, what are we trying to do? You better swing for the fences. There have been great Batman movies. You kind of have to feel like, okay, so can I come into this and do something definitive, distinctive, and different? That, to me, was the most important thing. You have been through this physical exertion to, too, right? So you're like, you just come away from all of that. Walk that beer, walk up from the stairs, and sit and finish. As soon as that body's back in, we're ready. Right. Speed. 17, okay, take five. Action! Whoa, 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 whoa. Police action. He's with me, officer. 
the first days of shooting, we started in the mayor's mansion. And it was one of these things that was really exciting, but it was also very scary because how does a masked man with a cape walk into a crime scene and how do you make that feel real? And so these first days, they were really about figuring out how Batman sounded, how he moved, how he looked, how the other characters related to him. Thumb was severed. Killer may have taken it as a trophy. He was alive when it was cut off. Echimosis. Matt was very, very clear saying he wanted to make this a detective story, but right from the beginning. And so you think, okay, so he's the greatest detective in the world. What makes a good detective? You're basically someone who just is exceptionally observant. There's an element of being sort of like a savant or a witch doctor or something. You just have heightened, heightened senses. We actually went over in these first few days because we were just trying to figure out what does this Batman movie feel like? And shooting this scene was really, really challenging and ultimately set the tone of the whole movie. What's great about the series is that it's very much in the eye of the beholder. The storytelling has evolved, you know, since 1939 to today in what Matt's done and what the Batman series has evolved into is not so much kind of a black and white good versus evil idea, but something a little bit more nuanced. Let's play a game, just me and you. Any of this mean anything to you? And in this case, allowing us to go back to the origins of the Batman, which is DC, it's detective comics. I wanted to lean hard into the noir side of the Batman and make him the world's greatest detective because that's what he started as, right? And, you know, the Bob Kane, Bill Finger stories, they were really noir stories, and he was a detective, and he was solving crimes. There was something about doing it as a noir. I mean, even though Batman is always kind of a noir, but, like, it's never just fully committing to that world. I came up with the idea of having the character that he was interacting with, the case that he was involved with, being a new iteration of the Riddler. A character who was killing pillars of the society, but in the wake of these murders, he's revealing at the crime scenes through ciphers and puzzles the history of corruption in Gotham. And for me, what was important was that that case eventually starts to lead into Bruce Wayne, and the story would become very personal. And really, through the course of this story, he'd be challenged to become a better Batman. Great, you all set, mate? Yes, mate. Good. Roll camera, please. OK, so I'm staring at us. Okay, then he goes off to your right. Matt wrote a really good script, and I remember reading it the first time, and, you know, page 10, 20, going, gosh, this is, this is good. Like, it's, it's tight, it's solid, it's really well-conceived. It's uh, unexpected. This person, this writer, this director is driving at something. I was riveted by it. It's dark, it's weighty. There's an incredible depth to it, an incredible sense of loneliness and isolation. I thought Matt did an amazing, amazing job on creating the script and on creating the world and the sense of danger. This has kind of a youthful film noir element to it, which I don't think you've seen in the other ones. You know, between Zoe and the Riddler and Robert, everybody's got their dirty laundry. It just depends what you do with it. You owe it to the fans to go ambitiously as deep as possible. Matt is a very specific, thorough filmmaker. He's an incredible writer. Everything is about character, emotion, and theme, and everything is built out from there. What's so wonderful about this world is the exploration of the gray area, and I really think that's why this film is different than any other Batman we've seen before. It's about sleuthing. It's about thinking through the clues, and again, just takes us back to the core of what Batman is and what Gordon is. They're detectives. I mean, I think there could be some, maybe some comment. You know, comment yeah, yeah, what would be? Like yeah, I think that's better. You know what I mean? As yeah. opposed to where do you start, for some reason, that's, that's feeling a little phony to me as, a, as an idea. Right, right. Whereas it goes, damn, I guess it's good to be the mayor. Something like that? Yeah. And Marcus. I guess it's good to be the mayor. You sure this isn't a leap? You don't trust me. You mean like you trust me? It's been two years now, and I don't even know who you are, man. The directors that have come before have interpreted these characters, you know, in their own images. 
And so my Gordon is very much reflective of the vision that Matt had for Gotham, but also it's, it's reflective of the work that Robert does as Batman. And they're very much, of course, a team. Some drive. Oh, this guy's hilarious. It's difficult for Gordon, because, like, you know, Batman has, he's pretty set in stone. Like, I do not trust anyone in the entire police department, but I trust you, like, probably about 60%. <laughs> this was, again, very much inspired from the partnership that they had in Frank Miller's year one. Gordon in that story was a very human character. He was imperfect. I really wanted a character who had a, an innate goodness, but was swimming against a tide of corruption. Gordon, as this kind of overwhelmed <laughs> everyman, reaches out to Batman out of the sense that he's a capable figure. And he's also, I think, what I've discovered in playing, <laughs> in playing this, he's one of his biggest fans. <laughs> You know, Jeffrey is very funny, and he's got great charisma as well. He's an amazing actor. He was not at all afraid, and we talked about this a lot, to have egg on his face. Put me in the face. They had a very unique kind of rapport, and it was in that sense like a buddy comedy. There's a confidence Jeffrey has. It's like a humor in what he's doing that I think is slightly different. He's just trying to do his best, aspiring towards some type of uh, <laughs> justice or, but he's not, he's not nearly there. And you know, whether he has the capacity to be there is another thing, but he's at least, you know, trying. Spreading out in a mechanical way. Yeah, I want to make sure right. so he's just kick the out of this guy. He looks up and it's like, I'm just trying to figure out how to see, how to read that moment. So take the last hit and look up at them, okay? Action. Okay, so 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 what it, what it feels like you're doing is checking with each other. Who really wants to face him? But it's like, okay, so we're doing this, except who the is gonna do it? With that in mind, do we try that once more with that idea? Bye, guys. All right. You don't have to go any further than the first So, keep Frank's Camera will call these, please. All right, so real life, ground effect. You know, in the Burton movie, I remember, it was such an exciting moment when that guy says, you know, who are you? And he says, I'm Batman. That was such a definitive moment. Somewhere early in the writing, I came up with this idea of him not saying, I'm Batman. He's actually, at this stage in his career, kind of a frightening figure. And I wanted him to use that phrase that is in so many of the comics, which is for him to say, I'm vengeance, because this is a personal mission. He's had this concept of Batman, which he's been building for a year, and he doesn't know if being Batman is gonna work or do anything. He's just compelled to do it. That's a kind of important differentiation of this Batman. Basically, the options are kind of death or being Batman. This whole thing starts really because of what happened to him as a child. And what he's doing is he's taking out his vengeance for what happened to him. And I always just get the impression that he just wants to keep recreating the night where his parents died. All the fights seem very personal. He's fighting a stranger as if they have personally harmed him every single time. They think I'm hiding in the shadows. But I am the shadows. I wanted a shocking moment where these guys would be terrorizing this commuter, and out of the shadows would come Batman, and they'd think, well, who is this goof in this costume? I'll knock his ass out. And then he would reveal himself with such ferocity that you'd be shocked, and you'd know right then, oh, it's this version of Batman. It's not just disarming people, it's punishing them. The hell are you supposed to be? I'm vengeance. I 
at the end of the day, he doesn't even really have that much in the way of technology to give him an advantage against the people he's fighting against. I mean, he has a few layers of bulletproof armor and a few gadgets, but it's pretty rudimentary. I mean, he's very, very, very fallible. Batman doesn't have powers, he just has a drive and he has the resources. I thought, well, okay, so then he's gonna create this bat suit. The purpose of the bat suit is twofold. One, it's to intimidate and scare the hell out of the criminal element. Two, it has to be very protective, it has to be very tactical, it has to be like riot gear. My ambition is to try and make everything feel very real. I want to be so into the film that I should almost not notice the costume because it should just feel in place as much as the buildings behind them feel in place and everything should just feel right. Well, it's quite daunting because you're trying to think what else can you bring to something like this? When I was younger, that's when they first made the kind of Michael Keaton suits. That was the kind of high technological costume making at that time. Matt's inspirations are very dark detective films. Gotham's this kind of rotten sort of New York of the 70s. And then there's Batman, and he looks like he's part of that. The bat suit is in evolution. This is the year two version, and I wanted you to get the feeling that Bruce had put that together in the Batcave. have an initial conversation about the direction, what kind of feel it should be, the tone of the suit. So then Glyn will go away and kind of do some kind of exploratory drawings, then we'll come back, then we'll discuss. One of the first things that I did was scribble out some, some bat logos, because that's got to be one of the most iconic symbols, not only in comics history, but film history, and it's all over the world. Most of them are taken from real bats in flight. Me and Dave, we both liked 22. And luckily, when Matt came back to us, that was his favorite as well. I wanted to see the seams. I wanted to see his suit had been scarred and military gear was an inspiration for the crafting of it. One of the main concerns always with all Batman suits is movement and what the actor can actually do. So we were kind of determined to make Robert as agile as possible. It's all divided into panels and elements, so it allows for full exploration of whatever he needs to do. Get out of here, freak. <laughs> Matt had talked about he liked the idea that he's like an MMA fighter. He's rougher, you know. I mean, he wanted it to be scary. So I, wanted, I thought maybe the cow could be more skull-like. Some of this around here, it's kind of sculpted in like you would around, around a skull. And this nose piece, which is from the front, it's got that opening in the face. And obviously, it's also inspired a little bit by the Adam West. The body of the suit, it's very much based in US military or sort of late Vietnam to contemporary kind of military techniques and sort of ballistic protection. <laughs> Everything has a function. So when it came to, what are we going to do about this? Can it be something that's practical? So then we came up with the idea that, well, yeah, maybe it's something you can, some blades that you can use. We were all talking about it, and then as we were talking about the logo, it just kind of came to the top that this could be the knife. Because of the nature of the actual bat symbol was very utilitarian, could we just take it out of the chest? A lot of the talk online was that it was Joe Chill's gun, but I'm sorry, that's not where we came from on this. But I like, I like the gun idea, but it's not what we were thinking. The gloves. Now, the gloves have a mini taser. Ah! And we've got his van braces, which contain his grapple gun. Matt liked the idea of taxi driver, you know, when he kind of flicks out the secret little gun. That's old school engineering. So he's able to fire, fire his, uh, his hooks. So that's eventually what gets deployed out. So this opens out and allows them to pull him up, up building in the classic way. It was, it was fun to make, you know, the guys in the, in the workshop do a great job. The first time I put it on, I mean, I'd been in the Batman Forever bat suit and realized you are basically a statue in there. And so the first time I put on this bat suit, there's so much more maneuverability of it. I was like, oh, wow. It's like wearing normal clothes. <laughs> but then it's definitely not like wearing normal clothes at all. He looks great in the suit. <laughs> It's crazy though when I with his jawline and everything when you see him in the in the bat suit silhouetted 
he looks like the comic. It just creates a magic and a masking of the Bruce Wayne identity in a way that's really powerful. I think it's a function of the design, but also a function of him as an actor. When I was saying to Dylan and Matt, I was like, wow, it is, it is very transformative. It's just incredibly surreal sometimes when you're like, wait, that, oh, I'm actually doing this. <laughs> The costume team is incredible on this film. I take quite a huge responsibility in effectively putting all those people's craft on screen. Trying to see into a character through a dark costume, through dark eyes, is very hard. To see emotion, but not give away the mood. Light is super important to me. It's one of the reasons why I love working with Greg. It's funny, because we would look at different things, and we'd look at the cowl, he'd turn a light on, and we'd both look at it, and if, when a certain light would come on, we'd go, oh, sad, no good. When we got really excited, we knew something was really exciting. We wanted to remind viewers about first Batmans, you know, the, the early comic books, the character that, that lurks in the shadows. From every single angle, we wanted to be able to take light away from his foreground, but to be able to recognize his silhouette. But within those silhouettes, you needed to see deep into Batman's character. So it became quite clear that we really needed to sort of skirt the line of fill light in the eyes or no fill out the eyes. Because not seeing into the soul of a character sometimes is more telling than seeing into the soul of a character. Finding that balance between seeing detail and not seeing detail, that was one of the, the big things that we explored very early on. So we are at Leavesden Studios, where we started filming this amazing production Everyone's up against it, and the time, time's tight, and there's so much to do. There's a remarkably good uh, energy and really exciting sort of feel behind the project. I mean, Matt took years to write this project, and he talks about it all, all the time. And so to come into, you know, to come into another iconic story and to face all those challenges together, it, it's fantastic to see it finally coming together. Shall I take this as a good sign? What? Your attire. Is Bruce Wayne making an actual appearance? I was trying to think about what's the way into Bruce Wayne we haven't seen but still makes complete sense as to who this guy is. And I started thinking about the notion of the Waynes themselves and the idea of him being the child of Gotham royalty and basically a lost prince. I often listen to music when I'm writing and I just one day put on something in the way uh, by Nirvana, and there was something in the tone of that. I said, this is, this connects to the movie. I don't know why, but this has to do with Bruce Wayne. I like the idea of a guy who's become like a rock star, and he's like a recluse who's in this decaying Wayne Manor. Welcome to Wayne Tower, uh, to Wayne's world. Alfred is a bit of a stickler for, uh, for order and, and, and precision, but Bruce isn't. This has become almost like a museum to Thomas and Martha, and Alfred has become the caretaker, not only of this place, but of course, the most precious cargo, which was, which was Bruce himself. Alfred was the one who taught him how to defend himself as somebody who was former MI6. He tries to teach him how to be a man, and so he's partly responsible for what Bruce has become. He's a surrogate father who never chose to be a surrogate father. Bruce has taken the only thing Alfred thought he could teach him and just taken it to this extreme extreme extent where now Alfred thinks he's going to die. He does carry with him this sense of survivor guilt, having been the bodyguard that actually let down Thomas Wayne and Martha, his mother. He feels deeply, deeply responsible. It's getting serious, Bruce. If this continues, it won't be long before you have nothing left. We're shooting in the Gotham City Hall today. This is the funeral of Don Mitchell. 
We got to design this centerpiece of the city. It's a hybrid set. We're establishing the exterior up in Liverpool, and then obviously this interior is our creation. Coming to that set that day, like I'm looking around and this is like crazy. <laughs> like, this set is insane. Bruce Wayne, why haven't you called me back? I'm Bella Real. During all of that, this is where we get a real sense of who Bella is, what she cares about and who she cares about. Your family has a history of philanthropy, but as far as I can tell, you're not doing anything. Excuse me, Chief. I'm gonna talk to you. Gil Colson is missing. What? He hasn't been heard from since last night. Edward Nashton and the Riddler, once he sees behind the curtain of how Gotham City has been working, you know, it's a deep betrayal. <laughs> Unfortunately, it feels like he has to go to some pretty extreme lengths to be heard. The Riddler attaches a bomb to my neck and sets the stage for the big, the big scene. The main thing is, our parents have mistaken into the policy that we're running in this job. Once we cut, everyone in the state, in your end positions, you will now actually see a vehicle coming through. So please, everyone react on when that car comes through. Big scenes like that take a very long time. I remember we were filming in these hangars where they made zeppelins. Just like a huge number of extras and spectacle. There's a major action component to the scene. We're actually driving a car through the space. Good old fashioned practical effects. Great team, stand by here, please. And let's be again, let's be ready. There we go, we're rolling. Everyone set. And action. Stop. Stop. Arching around. Boom. Boom. Ah! Here comes the car! Archery call! to get what he wants, he needs a partner. You came. Puzzles, numbers, riddles, games. Look at Riddle it. number one. That's one of the only ways that he could escape. It can be cruel, poetic, or blind, but when it's denied, it's violence you may find. He needs the Batman to do some dirty work for him. Justice. Huh? The answer is justice. Yes! Justice! There's an incredible image at the end of Hush of the Riddler at this sort of chess match. And he's got this great smile, and he's kind of the puppet master. 20 seconds. I feel like it's a, a little bit like that, maybe. Oh. <laughs> You know, when we had to shut down because of the pandemic, I reviewed the footage, but a lot of that mental planning was also done in uncertainty because you just didn't know, you know, when it was going to end or when it was going to be safe to start shooting again. And honestly, it was a very scary time. One of our crew members ended up dying. Andrew Jack, who was our um, one of our, our dialect coaches, a wonderful man, um, you know, in the two weeks after we shut down, he was gone. We dedicated the film to him. It's a terrible loss. It's heartbreaking that he's gone. And I know so many people during the pandemic lost people close to them, and, and we were no different. And so we knew that in our, in our shooting, we had to take this business deadly seriously, and we did. Sir? 
the if we were if we were if we were um, superstitious, which we're not, but if we were, we would say this is a good time to uh, start back up. Yeah, and that would be Sarah. We're back shooting, but I'm also really proud of our crew and our people and Matt and our team uh, that we are putting our heads down and safely and smartly continuing to make this movie. Making a movie of this scale in a normal world is, is a huge deal. But making it in the middle of a pandemic is, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know how. To, to get the wheels turning again of, of something of, of this scale it's just huge. We're, we're small right now. You know, we started with scenes with two people and we shot some really interesting things, but pretty soon we start getting outside, more people, extras, and, but again, we're, we're, we got a lot of people checking in place to just um, uh, make sure we do it correctly. Hello, mate. How are you? Good. Why do you look so fresh? I have no idea. Good. So maybe it's your eyes are blurry, because I don't feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Just ready for Liverpool? <laughs> Are you ready for Liverpool? I'm kind of looking forward to Liverpool. Yeah, 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 it'll be good. Attention, we are going to write the next code. If I called your name, please come over here. We are in Liverpool. I'll, tr I'll trust you that it's day 55. It's really hard to keep track of these days now. This is the arrival to the mayor's funeral. And so Bruce is coming here really as a detective. And so he's coming here just looking for suspects. Ready and back in action. Ready and action. Bruce Wayne? <laughs> Hey, hey, some space here, will you slick? Go around. Brought out the one guy in the city more reclusive than me. Ours, you know Bruce Wayne? Wow, is that right? Carmine Falcone is one of the big reasons why this city is the way it is. I was really excited about that character, and one of our casting people, Cindy Tolan, said to me, well, who, who do you think's the type? And I said, well, to me, like, the fantasy type would be, like, John Turturro. And she said, well, why don't we go to John Turturro? <laughs> Ooh, cool it is, huh? I've stayed away from playing bad guys, unless it's really complex. What are you looking for? I talked to Matt. I said, well, if there's something I could do that would be interesting. We talked about some real life figures that probably inspired it in reality. People aren't absolutely pure. Let's keep things festive down here, all right? I came to Penguin and the idea of Batman when Burgess Meredith played Penguin and Adam West played Batman. <laughs> I got you, you friggin' psycho! That's when I heard the opportunity to play Penguin. I was thoroughly intrigued. To me, his character is kind of like Scarface. He's totally underestimated, and he knows he can be more. I just feel like it's a version of Colin you've never seen, and it's a version of the character you've never seen. So it's, it's very special. I started looking at images online, like the Arkham series, and there was a couple of images of a guy who was kind of looked like he was a bare-knuckle fighter, almost, scarred up and, and bald. I was incredibly excited. You know, we fall in love with these great people, these skilled professionals, and Matt's process is he really brings his actors in, you know, to collaborate. Hey, Vincent! You know, so much of what you do when you're talking to actors is you're, you're connecting with them personally. But the truth is, I saw their faces, but they didn't see my face for the rest of the movie. I looked like this for the rest of the film, and it was quite a strange experience. He's like Batman, basically. He's more obscure than Batman. He's, he's got goggles on, a hat, and a mask. But it's, it's a little bit of an adjustment doing this. We wanted to shoot in a place that had real, historic, gothic architecture that we then built upon create our own Gotham so you felt you were seeing a place that looked like a big city, but a city at the same time that you'd never seen before, a city that was ours. Reset the traffic. Reset, guys, reset. 
There's no other way we would have been able to create the scale of this place without going to Liverpool. Get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> and they welcomed us there in this very special way. And it was a very unique experience. Action! Action! Go, 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 go! I mean, the great thing about being on location here is this scale. When I was a child and I was um, reading the comic books, that building there, uh, that's exactly how I saw Gotham. And it's so funny to be standing here making the Batman, and that's my childhood right in front of me, my own kind of image of what, of what Gotham actually looked like. Uh. We've come to do the opening shot which is, which is uh, we're establishing Halloween. We've created these hot dog stands and these little Japanese kind of yatai tents where you can just go and grab some hot food. And uh, nearly everything which is represented here is that there's a huge team actually behind me that helps gather all this stuff up. For, for this particular setup, it's taken about three or four days to do. So this is Tent City. The idea is just to make it look like a homeless city. The idea behind this stall is a donut sweet treat stall. So this is made by Jamie Wilkinson, who's a prop master. And so he, you know, his perfect place is between the hot dog stalls. Yeah, it's good. Bob. <laughs> this was the first set that Matt and I started talking about as we tried to develop the look of Gotham. So it was a global search it just is like a perfect fit. And it really is just sort of an establishing moment. We see him moving through the city as the drifter, and it's a real opening into the scale of Gotham. It's Halloween night, so we're feeling all that energy. All right, team, welcome. Welcome to Gotham's Fair. It's a fantastic set. It's a wonderful spectacle. Our plan of attack is we have a crane down the road there. That's our first setup. We have a lot of moving traffic, about 50 cars here that will be traveling. So we end with a crane shot of our drifter riding down this street, as well as a drifter rig shot as well, which will be rigged before we get there this evening. All right, good. Let's get Liverpool done. Well done, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Tonight, there's some extreme Halloween makeups, there's some very glamorous Halloween makeups, there's some really badly applied ones. We've got witches, we've got dolls, we've got sexy club goers. It's a mixture, but at the end of the day, they're going to be soaked. That in itself is quite a great look. We've got a lot going on here tonight. Ready? All right, bye. Here we go. Stand by. You can't walk through Gotham Square in your bat suit, or people will look at you and go like, well, there's that weird guy. When I was looking at the comics, I came across that sequence in Frank Miller and David Masticelli's Year One, where Bruce, before he's Batman, creates this other alter ego, which is not Batman yet, it's the Drifter. And it's funny because I looked at it and I thought, gosh, that reminds me of Taxi Driver. And I got the commemorative edition. And in it, I saw that in his notes to Mazzuccelli, Frank Miller said that Bruce Wayne in this scene when he's walking in the East End looks like he's just won the Travis Bickle lookalike contest. He looks like a vet. He looks like a Marine. 
I mean, I always like the idea that this version of Batman is, is going into like a kind of public restroom <laughs> to change into change into Batman. I mean, there's something so grimy and kind of rough about it. Two years of nights have turned me into a nocturnal animal. There's another element of showing how handmade his version of Batman is. I mean, he's literally got the bat suit in a bag <laughs> when he's going around trying to be as nondescript as possible. Speeding, yeah, Ready and action. Yeah, but what I'm saying is but let it drip over the, the, yeah, let, let's, go, all the way let's, let's have it drip over the, drip down yeah. past the cheekbones. Okay. We're going to spray a lot of water. Oh, yeah, that's here we go. This is kind of crazy. Look at that. That's yeah, great. That's lovely. That is so it's cool. When I was working on the script, toward the end, I just needed to do another pass to finish the third act and really land that, and I worked with another writer. And then he said to me, he goes, look, one thing that we've never seen, because when that, when that cowl comes off, he's sweating under there. We've never seen the eye makeup. And he goes, if you did that, like, you'd be my hero. And I was like, all right, we're doing that. And so we put that, that dripping cowl makeup in there because that's one of the realities of Batman. Rob, he really wanted to push the workwear, the idea that that's what makes you most invisible in a modern crowd. He spoke about the dock workers in Manhattan and the kind of workwear they wear and how you just pass in the crowd. Allowing that kind of grit felt like one more detail that felt fresh that you hadn't seen in the movies yet that we could do. I wanted to do a scene where you see the Batman and Selena looking out over the city. Greg Frazier mentioned to me he had started using this technology, the volume. We created a volume of light that was Gotham in a number of different locations. The idea is that the city streets below interacts into the faces of the characters. You may not see directly a car headlight sweeping across Batman's face or across Gordon's face, but you feel what is the conglomeration of all of those buildings together and the atmosphere illuminating the actors, and it just feels right. Greg could actually move the sun itself. This was one of those things that had not been done in a DC movie, had not been done in a Batman movie. It's one more thing that creates not only a photographic reality, but it creates a kind of creative reality for the actors as well. The content here you see is a very deep environment. There's many, many moving pieces, and we're pushing it as much as we can. We started out working on the Falcone's loft environment, a loft over a bridge with moving traffic and a huge digital city. And then here we're doing the searchlight building. After this, we've also got the cemetery. Other environments we've done are sort of a little bit more contained, slightly simpler open deserts. Here, it's a sea of detail. When we first sat down with the ILM guys, you know, we said, look, we want moving clouds, we want animated traffic. And it was a thing that was, it was a little bit bleeding edge for them. James and ILM and myself basically all had an opportunity to design this city. You know, for me, it was very simple. I needed something that would do what I needed to do for light. From James's perspective, he needed something that would fulfill his vision of this incredible city that we're filming in. Then ILM then needed to help marry those two ideas together. Once we knew we were going to be shooting on screens, I think we quickly realized it was going to be really beneficial to us to have a location in the world that we could shoot plates on. So we found a location in Lower Manhattan that was the position of the skyscraper and then sort of re built the world around it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful technology. We wouldn't have been able to shoot that scene in any other way. It looked 100% like we were on the roof of this place. Maybe we're not so different after all. Who are you over there? You know, me and Rob had this emotional and romantic scene on, the, on a roof, and to really have the cityscape, it was a game changer. It was incredible what they were able to do. Just don't make any moves without me. I told you, baby. I can take care of myself.
What have you done? Oh, you're really not as smart as I thought you were. And now it is time for retribution. One of the things that was important to the story was that I knew that Batman needed to go through a kind of baptismal transformation. The city itself needed to go through that as well. When I was talking to James Chinlin, we started talking about New Orleans and the flooding that happened after Katrina and the kind of how harrowing it was. In my mind, I saw Gotham at the end and its buildings coming up out of the water. It's a potential new beginning, but that the city has had to go through something quite traumatic. The scale of this sequence is so big. You know, Matt's vision of the end of the movie, this massive wall of water coming through the city. Breaking that down into pieces that we can actually shoot was really, really tricky. This is an incredible special effects piece that was built by Dom Tui and his team. We've got a lot of water pumps that are in here creating this kind of waterfall. We built a tank that's got 500,000 litres of water. It's an amazing combination of three locations, Chicago, the Thompson Center for the Exterior, London Interior, and then these pieces here on stage. Every shot we will do here, apart from when Batman starts to walk away, will be in camera. So what you see is, is what you get. To me, our third act is, it's a giant spectacle. And we're trying to do something emotionally surprising that was achieved with Matt and Rob working that moment where he realizes that he's culpable. I thought I knew what I was doing. I didn't have all the information. I have to become more. I believe in Gotham. I believe in its promise. But too many have been left behind for too long. Sins of the Father. It all started here. The idea of renewal. This was the path that described the history of the city and the history of corruption and how something that started off as a truly meant to help the city program from his father had been completely perverted. I think a lot of Batman stories ends with Batman believing that he's given hope to the city, that the symbol of Batman will create a brighter future. In this, I always kind of imagined it, that he's so committed to darkness and nihilism that he doesn't think that the city is capable of healing itself. Maybe this is all coming to an end. What is the Batman? It's just on a downward spiral, and he's just fighting a hopeless battle which will end in defeat. I wanted to get to a place where that message that he was projecting out would be reflected back to him, and that when it was, it rocks him to his core. Who the hell are you? I'm vengeance. There is a dark side to this idea of vengeance. Here we go. And so it is now his responsibility to somehow make this right and to even sacrifice himself if that's what it takes. There's a particular piece of music that Michael wrote for that scene that whenever I hear it really breaks my heart. 
I'd say that was one of the most important moments that I'd been after from the very beginning of trying to tell this Batman story. So that was a pretty special day. I just always liked the idea that at the end, it's actually the city which kind of opens up himself for a bit of hope. Him allowing himself to hope a little bit actually is the most painful thing that he has to do. If he allows himself to think that, then there is a possibility of positive change. Together, we will learn to believe in Gotham again. There are elements to these Batman stories that create a modern mythology that just plucks all the strings. And I think it's not so much that, you know, he's one thing or another, but that he's aspiring to be, aspiring to be greater, aspiring to be better. You know this place is never going to change. I have to try. I think all of the characters are so multidimensional. It's not black and white, and the humanity is what people really respond to. There is a very rich, adored, very protected and revered history to this character of Batman and to this world of Gotham and these criminals. There's a reason why things have lasted. And maybe everyone fantasizes about having a black cape, doing the right thing and being courageous if you could. I think Matt has put all of himself into the script in this film. I think he's got a lot of him in there. I've got a lot of me in there, yet it's the Batman, it's the Riddler. I just think it's truly exciting that we're getting to work with this material that, that means so much to people. I think it's not good. Oh, what do you do? It's press that green oh, button. No. <laughs> um, this was a hard movie to make. By far the hardest thing I've ever been a part of. Never worked on anything so long where we're in production because of what we went through. I thank you from the bottom of my heart because I care so much about what we do. This movie means so much to me, but you guys showed me that you care just as much. Thank you so much. Uh, but yeah, from my end, thanks for putting Call it. it, they want to hear it's a wrap, call it. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, I'm just giving it another 15 minutes of overtime. <laughs> I, 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 that's good. Uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. That is a wrap. <laughs> We were supposed to be doing this for about five, six months. We were there for a year and a half. We all had experienced something that none of us in our lifetimes had ever been through and that the whole world had never been through. And we made a movie during it. Not only that, but we made this movie during it, a movie that we loved and a movie about a character that we loved so much. <laughs> it's one of the major characters of the 20th century. So many people connect to it on such a deep level and for so many different reasons have some level of responsibility to the people who've invested so much in the character. And you can feel it. It's, uh, it's fun, though.